It's time for To The Last Drop Podcast with Liam Delcom and Brandon Nell. Welcome back. We're back. It's To The Last Drop and I'm Brandon Nell. I'm Liam Delcom. And I caught there with a uh, mouthful of coffee in his mouth. Offside there, as as we should. But that should be a penalty. But we'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, and, and you can advance me ten meters as well. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's been a very interesting rugby weekend. I mean, we we back today. Uh, there's been a host of impressive games around around the world. Uh, um, Champions Cup. Uh, I think we'll start off with that, and then we'll talk about some other rugby that's taken place. Uh, but yeah, so let's kick it off with the two massive Champions Cup games. Nothing, no surprises there. Uh, the two teams with nine stars between them are one. One of them is going to get an extra star come in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Leinster were impressive. Um, the offensive defense, as Jacques Nenava calls it, was was pretty impressive. But they sort of blew Northampton away very early on. And to lose, well, when they start steamrolling, uh, Harlequins were brave, but bravery doesn't count much on the scoreboard. Yeah, I think both games, uh, or the, at least the results, are fairly predictable. Uh, Leinster went about, you know, as clinical as you'd expect them to be in a in a knockout game. Uh, and as for the lose, uh, they were very much in the ascendancy, and then did lose their way a little bit. Uh, and and that's the kind of thing that they cannot, you know, afford to repeat in the final because uh, Leinster will blow them away. So, you know, but in the end, two very um, sort of predictable results. Yeah, and it's, it's the two biggest teams in the competition's history, the two teams that have won it the most, uh, the number one and two seeds. So, I mean, mm. I suppose it's the final that the competition wanted, uh, and there's going to be a huge heavyweight final as well. So, um, yeah, a, a very intriguing in a lot of ways. I think, I think to, to me, though, I mean, Semi-finals, I know people are sort of in, in both Toulouse and Lens, they're sort of wondering about how they let the opposition back in at times. But in the semi-final, you're playing quality opponents. Guys have played well to get there. You're always going to give away something in a game like that. You're not going to dominate for 50 points you know, in the semi-final. And we don't want to see that in any competition anyway. Um, mm. No, so, absolutely. So, um, no, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you you spot on. Um, I, I do feel, though, especially in the case of uh, of Toulouse, uh, that there were moments where their game management let them down. You you always feel with them that they have an extra gear, and if they do need to pick it up, um, they can. They've just got so many threats. Uh, but, but you know, they, as I said, I mean, there were a few moments where uh, they did drop their guard. Yeah, and and look, I mean. Playing in Toulouse, uh, at any stadium in Toulouse with that crowd, or well, the same as Croke Park, I suppose, uh, you're going to have the crowd on your side. So it's going to be interesting in a neutral venue, venue how that affects them. But you certainly could feel at times that the crowd, especially in the Toulouse game, uh, were, and, and the French TV directors were uh, affecting some of the play quite, quite uh, I mean, there was there was one high shot. I can't even remember where it was in the first half. and You didn't even see a replay of it, but the one on DuPont was replayed like ad nauseum. And... You just couldn't get off yeah. get it off the screen until there was a call. I, I, yeah, again, um, as, as to be expected, entirely so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I agree with you. I mean, to lose to me is just a side that is not clinical, but to lose are the type of side that you just feel that could hit you with three tries in two minutes if they they need to. Yeah, and they've just got that sort of quality. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be an intriguing final. But I, I think, um, yeah, Jacques Ninaba was quite quite open about it, but how, you know, all that re- you really need to do in the semifinal is win. Uh, there were some of these yeah. Leinster um, reporters who were, you know, you know said, why didn't Leinster put them away, Northampton away? And, and I mean, you know, Jock's been there before, and I mean, he referred to the England result in the World Cup as as one of those games, doesn't matter how you win it, you win it. And you win it, you go mm. home with the trophy. So that's all that really matters. But have a listen to himself chatting about the game afterwards. Um and yeah, talking about how Leinster are going to approach the final. I would probably say the main takeaways was I thought we were, I think the whole world will know that, I, that we were probably for 60 minutes, uh, we were in, in control. We had good control over the game. And then obviously with the quality of opposition that we had, uh, and you can see why the Saints are the top premiership team currently. I mean, they they never, they never kept um, attacking and coming uh, at us. 
And obviously then we had to finish out the game in the last uh, um, eight minutes or so, uh, which some of it we did well, some of it we... Uh, we, some of it we did really well, some of it we could have done better. So that was probably the take home. Uh, so I think, in, yeah, from our view, there's lots to work on uh, going into the final. But not thinking about the final just yet. I, I, I said that to the lads as well. I think if we, if we lift our heads up to too high and start looking at the horizon, we might fall over this, uh, we might fall over the obstacle right in front of your face. I think it probably boils down to execution. Uh, I think you must take the opportunities that you create and uh, and that's it. You know, you must, uh, if you get an opportunity, you must you must capitalize on it. And probably we had a couple of opportunities which we didn't capitalize on, uh, which was our own uh, wrongdoing, uh, some of them. But some of them was also due to the quality of opposition uh, that, that you had, that we had in, in, in the Saints. No, I think... <clears throat> The, like I said, now we 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 probably the main thing for us is not to focus too much on on what 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 will happen in the future and start focusing on what we must do and uh, uh, try and get right during the week, preparing for Osprey. So uh, I think as professional athletes, as coaches, you, you get onto the next thing as quickly as possible uh, because that is the reality. I mean, what happened on Saturday happened. It's in the past. Um, that we, there's nothing we can do about it and uh, and nothing that only the lessons that we can take out of that we can carry into the future but the future was today's training session uh, and we must focus on the future we must focus on things that we have to get right for for Saturday against Ospreys yeah I must say uh, that's probably the nice thing for me I don't have a big backdrop or big history of uh, for me it's just listen I know Toulouse is a quality outfit uh, we had players that played there when I was with the Springboks, um, so they were very. They were always very. Uh, uh, they spoke well about the club. They spoke well about the people there and the rugby program that they run. Uh, so I expect a proper test uh, um, uh, when we play them in a couple of weeks' time. But to be honest, um, I watched the game yesterday, but I was doing my review, so I probably watched it with chameleon eyes, one eye doing the review and one eye looking what's happening there. So, But I'll get to them. We'll get, uh, as a coaching group, as a group of players, we'll get to them and give them the, due, the respect that they need to get whenever we have to play them. But like I said, the team that needs respect now is probably Ospreys. Not probably, it is Ospreys, 100%. And Jacques is spot on. Uh, you know, Leinster have tripped up a couple of times now at the semi-final stage. Uh, this is very much a competition that they've uh, put into sharp focus. It's one that they uh, that they want to win. Um, and of course, I mean, there's also, I mean, they're fighting on, on many fronts. So, you know, just get the result and move on. Try and win the final. Yeah, and and I mean, I, if I, if I look at the Challenge Cup, and I know there's a bit of a debate amongst some of the journalists about how much you could look into the Challenge Cup, but I mean, for the Sharks, uh, that was an absolutely amazing game in Clermont. Uh, yeah, they you really thought they were down and out and buried, and they came back to win it. And I mean, another one point victory over over a French side for a South African side. Uh, yeah, it's sort of adding to all the uh, the litany of them. But uh, yeah, you, you think to yourself. For the Sharks, this is so important for them. It might be a second-tier competition uh, in some people's eyes, but, um, yeah, it's certainly something to give them something for the season, and it could kickstart them. If you look at how Glasgow lost in the final last year, now they're top of the URC, you can easily make that argument uh, that it could kickstart your next season. Yeah, and it also goes back to you play what's in front of you, and what is in front of them is the Challenge Cup and the opposition in it, and they seem to be relishing that. Uh you know, that competition. Um, I thought that they did, well, they did look uh, dead and buried for a while there. Uh, I think the thing that will stand them in good stead is how they found ways to get back into that game uh, and winning a very tight contest in a, in, a, in a European competition because that's the kind of muscle memory that you want to build when you're going to play in, in, a, in a Champions Cup. Um, of course, that is their stated ambition as well. I mean, we've spoken to the the owner and we've spoken to various people at the Sharks and that's obviously one of their long-term ambitions as well. So, I mean, that kind of result and the way it was achieved um, will stand them in good stead. 
I think I think a lot of people will say that Clemont should have should have won that game. Uh, they had um, not just the better opportunities, but they they looked the sort of better oiled team for mm. for most of that game. But the Sharks, to their credit, I mean, found ways to get a foothold and and win that game. I mean, even it's a bit I thought was absolutely massive. Uh, sort of dragging his team along and finding ways of, of um, exploiting weaknesses um, in that game. So you know, uh, good on them. Yeah, and I mean, to me, I, I think the Sharks, if you can, if they're going to look at themselves and and Joe Moncalo, the defense coach, looks at that game again. They were increasingly brittle on the outside, on the wings. Um, mm-hmm. Clermont found ways through the defense on the outside way too easily and and scored a number of tries that way. Um, but yeah, you you can't fault the, the the bravery to get back into that game, uh, and of, of course the one man who stood out, who's now suddenly become the the biggest um, asset in the Sharks, is Siamasuku. And uh, yeah, what a what a season he's having! Four consecutive Man of the Match awards, um, and really he's just been a revelation. I suppose you could look at it two ways. You could say to yourself, well, perhaps that's because the Ku and Bosch and Witte Chamberlain, who they had before them. Um, play very different games and probably weren't as effective um, uh, for the Sharks. And and Tia Masuku's just brought something totally different. His cross kicks, uh, his kick passes have been ex- exceptional. And just the way he reads a game for a young player like that has uh, certainly brought him into, I suppose, Springbok uh, consideration. Yeah, I, I thought that he played with um, a lot of composure. He, he was calm. Um, th- that to me are the you know sort of the the, the hallmarks uh, of the player thus far. I mean, it, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, I know the Sharks in that position have been quite troubled uh, the last couple of seasons, um, and he doesn't seem to play with that burden. I think he you know kind of puts his own stamp on it. Um, and despite the pressure, I mean, they didn't hardly put a foot wrong. Um, so you've got to really commend the way he's gone about the business. I mean, obviously kicking, what was it? Uh, eight successful kicks. And of course that uh, clutch kick at the end, that was just uh, stuff of legend. So um, yeah, it, it is going to, you know, uh, catapult him into um, higher conversation. And uh, we'll have to see how that develops further down the line. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, people might uh, sort of scoff, some non-shock supporters might laugh at the fact that I'd say, yeah, spring box selection. But when you think of the options for the box out there, you got uh, yeah, obviously Andre's there, Marnie's there, uh, but there's not too many other guys pick, putting up their hands. Jordan Hendricks has been around for a couple of seasons. Uh, he's obviously being seen as a future guy as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Galaxy are coming through like that. He's young. He's he's playing with composure. He's playing with all those spring box. That certainly brings him to the forefront. And um, depending on what the options are and what the game that Grassi wants to play, I won't say against Ireland, but you might see him make an appearance somewhere like Portugal and then slowly get blooded into that. If they if they do feel that he's you know, somebody who can play 20, 30 tests for them. Yeah, um, I, I, I think it's good to have options. So uh, we, we saw in the build-up to the last World Cup uh, where our depth in certain areas uh, was tested. So... You know, there might be two guys or three guys uh, in front, but if you um, invest enough in the pipeline, then, you know, you're going to have to dig into that um, from time to time. And I think it's a uh, fly-off, obviously, is one of those key positions where you yeah. you want strength in depth. Yeah, and, and I mean, it just takes two weekends of, of mm-hmm. you know, a mishap with, a, a knee injury or uh, something like that, and and you've got some problems. And um, yeah, unfortunately, Andre has had a number of injuries over the years. Um, Marnie not so much, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it could easily be, become that sort of argument. But we'll, I think we'll probably get into a bit closer to the time a bit more of those sort of yeah uh, you know, limitations. I, th- I think it's also probably worth saying that um, if Andre is going to play in the next World Cup, then the way he's managed over the next few years is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, you don't expect him to play every test because, I mean, that the, the toll on the body and, uh, you know, mentally it's 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 quite draining. And we know what, what the guy possesses. So uh, there might be opportunities for other players to, um, to get some playing opportunity. Yeah. And, I mean, as we've seen, I mean, the big question has to be is for any player now from this World Cup squad, Will they still be okay in four years' time in Australia? And 
you know, if not, you've got to build that depth. And and they didn't really have that opportunity in the last two World Cups to really build depth. So now hopefully they'll be doing that. So um, we could see a lot of guys coming through. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the other, we didn't see much of the other, oh, I didn't see much of the other semi final in the Challenge Cup. Uh, but uh, Gloucester, the, they seem to be the Cup champions. They've been in how many mm. Challenge Cup finals and Cup finals in the last couple of years? Haven't won much. So I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing for the Sharks. Uh, but certainly they, they've got an interesting opposition in that final. Yeah, I think it's five finals for them, so uh, they are regulars in, in that sense. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to predict this one because you've got one team that is established in that competition and, and kind of knows how to win, uh, and you, you've got another team that doesn't have that experience, but they certainly have the firepower um, and the wherewithal to win, to win games. So um, it's also one where the Sharks, if you look at their history, if you look at the, uh, if you take it back to Super Rugby, uh, sort of international cross continental competitions uh, where they haven't had silver, where they've been one of the better teams, you know, in those competitions. But um, the the silverware has eluded them. So you know they'll be very, they'll be desperate to to lay claim to to the Challenge Cup. So it, it's it's going to be a very interesting final. While we're talking about Springboks, we're just going to touch on one of the more bizarre stories of the week. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw it there, that uh, a certain ex-Springbok fluff, uh, Mr. Elton Yankees, who's who's got um, <laughs> a colourful past, should we say, um, went and put up a post on Instagram telling people that despite testing positive for a banned substance, uh, he would be back sooner than later, and he's got all the evidence on organisations, and these are his words, that uh, aren't doing things right, whatever that meant. Um, I'm not quite sure what that would mean because truly your your test is what, what counts in, in sort of a doping case. Um, I, I think there was sort of an insinuation that there might be more to the story, but um, yeah, without anything further than that, and now he's gone and deleted the post, yeah, which makes you wonder, yeah, are we is this a storm in a teacup or... Uh, or is this um, a much larger story waiting to be played out? And um, I think we both <laughs> uh, have our ideas, but um, I think Elton's um, making some rather interesting choices lately. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it is also uh, sort of straight from the Elton Yankees playbook. Um, yeah. There's always a bit of intrigue, always a bit of mystique. Uh, you never know what's coming next. Um, yeah, the, the way he the way he's decided to tackle this issue um, is interesting because you've got to ask yourself what is he going to do beyond his playing days? Does he envisage a career uh, in rugby still? Um, and if so, you know, uh, how is he going to sort of smooth uh, paths to to do that to achieve that? Um, so I mean, it's, I think it's probably best to wait until you know he comes yeah. forward with more. I mean, we, it's pointless. Yeah, I think I, I right. think the the problem with this is is uh, yeah, unfortunately, as you say, it's the Elton Yankees playbook. We've seen things like this before, and both you and I know about um, off field incidents that haven't been reported and things like that in his playing days, where he perhaps stepped out of the line here and there um, in terms of of team protocols and things like that. Um, and it was always the same excuse. It was always somebody else's fault. It was always something else. Uh, whether it's something like that in this, whether he does actually have something on somebody else, who knows? Um, but it's yeah, you leave it so murky, and 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 yeah, it's that somebody you, you can almost insinuate anything from from his statement. Uh, I think, but it comes back to the same thing. Unfortunately, ninety nine percent of of people who are busted in uh, in doping um, you know, positive tests, uh, you look at a period the auntie, it was never him, it was somebody else's um, water bottle or something that he drank. Uh, Chili Boy Rolapele was the same, also wasn't him, etc. Uh, unfortunately, with any of these type of cases, it's always the same sort of answer. And uh, until Elton shows us anything different, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just that. I think we can coin the phrase, let's wait for the B song. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. You throw something like that out there. If you don't back it up, then, well, 
yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But uh, yeah, the, the, turning to URC this week, um, we're back with the URC. So three rounds left, um, some big games coming up, and we're going to quickly run through those and give some our thoughts on them. Uh, yeah, and then and yeah, I think uh, some big clashes, none bigger um, this week than Loftus Fairsfeld, where the Bulls face Zog leaders Glasgow, and Franco Smith uh, has won at Loftus Fairsfeld with other teams before. He's a shrewd operator. He'll know the place and, and what he's what he's going to face quite well. Uh, the Bulls, on the other hand, coming off a 60-point win over the Os- Ospreys, uh, won't be overawed by the, the whole thing. They'll be quite confident going into a 2 o'clock game uh, with quite nice weather. It looks like it's about 26 degrees this weekend at Loftus and, uh, and, and at altitude. So that's going to be a very intriguing game. Yeah, the the interesting part for me is uh, Glasgow. Uh, I've got the left it late. Um, they will only fly midweek. Um, if if you think of how Munster went about uh, the challenge of playing two games at altitude, um, you know, base themselves at the coast, give themselves a, a proper a run into the first game, and then go back to the coast, and then um, sort of uh, you know sort of trying to acclimatize their way. Uh, that way so it's they've gone the other way glasgow's gone the other way so uh it's sort of a late arrival uh staying in in johannesburg or just north of johannesburg um and we'll have to see how i mean obviously frank was given this a lot of thought so it'll be interesting to catch up with him just to, to ask him what the thought process was there they certainly arrive here with uh, a lot of momentum. Five we in the last five games it's five wins for them uh, bulls three wins in the last five so Glasgow very much decide uh, with the momentum, but this will be a proper test of you know uh, their credentials, their title credentials. Um, a poor performance at Loftus, um, I think, will will leave some mental scars as well. So it's one, it's it's, it's a big test for them, one way or the other. Yeah, I think the big question, I mean, a larger question is also next week when uh, yeah they face the Lions as well. What Lions team are they going to face? What uh, what if the Lions can get a result there? I think we say it every week the Lions play as well. will help the other teams in the competition. Um, and you never know what Lions team you're going to get there. Is it going to be the tame one or is it going to be the one that roars? So um, that's also going to be a huge part of of, of um, this tour. I, I, if I was Glasgow, I'd definitely be, be targeting at least five points out of this. You'd probably back yourself to beat the Lions. Uh, and whatever you get at Loftus would be a bonus. But uh, they're certainly going to mm. come for the Bulls. Absolutely. Um, they would certainly want to t- sort of test their game because, I mean, they're going to be in the playoffs. So it's, yeah. And they'll probably get a home um, a quarter final and a home semi final, possibly. Um, so this match, as much as anything else, is also preparation for that. So um, I think they'd want to leave Loftus, um, if not with the point, certainly with the. Uh, take some confidence away from the from the encounter because um you know those battles further down the line will be probably even tougher than having to go to Loftus. Yeah um well it's gonna be a tough game either way. I think we'll start off with Friday's game. Stormers are going on tour. Uh, they're taking all these spring box with them on tour. They need to win basically everything in the remainder of the competition. Uh, obviously, we're all hoping that it, that it doesn't put them on a collision course with the Bulls, but I think the permutations are if the Bulls basically win everything and the Stormers win everything, they in fourth and fifth. And um, mm. that could put us on another quarterfinal or that North-South derby, which uh, I don't think anybody in South Africa really wants, to be very honest, But uh, except for, I suppose, people who organize these games because there'll be a full house and a lot of excitement, a lot of banter going on before the time. There'll but, be huge hype. Yeah, yeah. Just it, it doesn't. They need. They playing the dragons. It's a game they should target. The dragons haven't been good this year, and with their spring box, the Stormers should have too much class, even in Wales. Um, yeah. To and if they really are serious title contenders, they should win this quite well. Yeah, I mean, the dragons only what's it one win in the last five. The Stormers marginally better. I think three from their last five. So. Uh, they've got a bit more going for them. They've got players coming back significantly. I think also they've got a couple of loose heads coming back. So is probably one of them uh, that will have alleviated the pressure uh, on the guys who have been standing. And so uh, it is looking up for them in terms of the you know the, the injury list. Uh, they've also got Sasha Feinberg and Gumzulu back. Uh, gives them options in midfield. Uh, I think those are all you know 
big positives for the Storms, but they need to now back that up on the field. Um, you know, get past the Dragons. Um, not the dragon. Well, it's Connacht as well, I suppose. Um, that line weight. So, you know, two massive matches before they last one against the Lions, who will probably be the fresher side in that final contest, uh, the final league contest, because they have to travel to Cape Town, but the Stormers have to come from Europe. Well, the good thing that if you get the five points this week, you could probably start permutations and giving yourself, knowing what you want to achieve or who you want to play, should I say. Uh, if you know you're going to play away from home, where would you rather play yeah, in the next couple of weeks? Uh, especially by the time they get to that Lions game in the last round, uh, they'll definitely know what they need to do. Uh, so it's going to be interesting too. But um, yeah, listen to uh, listen to John Dobson and Franz Malhaber talking uh, very briefly uh, about uh, their tour and what their objectives are. We put ourselves a lot under pressure with our you know with our first tour we had, and obviously with that uh, that sort of quite devastating defeat to the Ospies, you know. You know, we're sitting in a position where a while ago we were looking at where we wanted to play in the playoffs and going for the top, uh, oh, not the top, you know, the top couple. Now we've just got to make sure we're playing Champions Cup. So we're under a lot of pressure. Anyone will tell you that it's very important. We all know how tight the log is. It's going to determine where we end, obviously. And we, we want to go for our own playoffs. Tough challenge for us, but yeah, we're really looking forward to it. And, you know, it's going to be a desperate game for us. It's unusual we're traveling late to a Friday game. So there's not much we can do in Wales. And that was almost the plan. We're trying to do everything here last week. So I think it was good for us last week to have our plans for uh, Dragons already sort of in place. It's going to be a bit edgy in terms of time and recovery. But, uh, you know, if we'd left a day earlier, we couldn't train here this week. And it'll be hard to train in Wales. So it's been a good prep in terms of the extra last week's work on the, on the Dragons. I thought we'd done a lot of good stuff this season, the way we fought back off the tour, our European campaign, you know, getting out of the pool of death, you know, coming so close. A lot of good in that respect. And I don't want to be like, if we don't do this, but that is the subtext, isn't it? Um, Friday night's also got another game. Uh, ninth place, Edinburgh, against 16th place, Zebra. Uh, I don't think it's much of, and, and playing in Edinburgh as well. Uh, I think uh, the Scots are going to, and uh, Sean Everett's going to be looking for this win, a five-pointer here to put them into the top eight. They're very close. Uh, but yeah, a big game for them as well. I think they've got a fairly favourable draw uh, towards the end of the league stages. I mean, obviously they're very much in the hunt for a place in the top eight, and I think uh, the way the draw is shaped uh, will favour them. So you know, they will look at this particular game as a you know as a as a sure five pointer um, to get them kickstart you know that final search for a place in the top eight. Yeah, and then uh, going on to Saturday's games, Bulls Glasgow kicking us off. Uh, at four o'clock on Saturday, Scarlets at home to Ulster, who are seventh. Scarlets 14th. Ulster will be targeting that one for their top eight mm. hopes. Uh, you can't see the Scarlets. Uh, they've been, they haven't been great this season, so you can't see them doing well, but they could push Ulster in a surprise. <laughs> Uh, being optimistic, they they could. I mean, Ulster haven't uh, played the same authority this season, so there is that possibility. But I think now, uh, you know, uh, they have something proper to play for. I mean, it's uh, if they, if they lose to Scarlets, I mean, do they really deserve to be in the top eight? You could ask. Yeah. Uh, then the Sharks at also at four o'clock playing Benetton, which would have been the Challenge Cup final if Benetton had beaten the last night. Mm. Um, in Durban, though, and with the Sharks, I think, having a bit of momentum. Benetton have been a strange side this season. They've been tough. But, um, yeah, can't see them beating the Sharks in Durban. Yeah, the odd thing is uh, Benetton was very high up the points table at some point. Um, I've had a bit of a wobble of late, only two wins in, in their last five. Um, and despite uh, all the Sharks' woes in this competition, I think they've actually scored more tries than Benetton. Um, so an interesting matchup, um, and and one where it'll also be interesting to see how the Sharks uh, put out their stall in terms of personnel, because um, I think they'll probably, you know, uh, they've got a bigger fish to fry later in the month. Then the big derby of the weekend, Munster against Connacht. Um, uh, Munster should win this one. I think they're probably favourites where they're sitting now and the way they've been playing in the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Uh, Connacht um, still uh, top eight hopes. Um, they they uh, sitting at sixth at the moment, so they don't want to lose that. And I suppose in a derby game like South African derbies, you can't write them off. But I think Munster should probably take this one. 
Yeah, I don't think we should dwell on this one too much. Uh, both teams obviously have something proper to play for. Uh, Munster can still get into the top two. So, um, yeah, you'd have to say Munster. Yeah, some interesting ones to play for. Uh, then the, on Saturday night at 6.15, Lions playing Cardiff. Cardiff have been unlucky a lot of the season. They've lost lots of their games by less than seven points. Uh, coming to the spark, Lions still have a chance to make the top eight, although that's starting to fade fast. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, they should be able to beat the Welsh side, but uh, with this Lions side, we never really know. Yeah, they should be able to beat Cardiff. Uh, if they beat Cardiff um, and then spring a potential surprise against uh, Glasgow, it puts them back in the conversation and then they have to go to Cape Town for that last game against the Stormers. And they actually won there a few seasons ago. Uh, I think in the inaugural uh, URC, they went to Cape Town and beat the Stormers there just before Christmas. Um, but, in, you know, then they will also have something decent, a proper carrot that would be dangled. Um, but they need to get over the first hurdle, and it's Cardiff. Um, I, I think they'll get over the first one. The other two, not so sure. Yeah, if you're not going to win your home games, you're not going to be in that conversation. So yeah. uh, that's the bottom line for the Lions. And, 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 and their inconsistency has been about the most consistent thing about them this season. So. Um... Yeah. And then the last one, which I think, um, again, depends which team gets played. Uh, Leinster are hosting the Ospreys. And after last week, there's some probably battered bodies. But, yeah, the Leinster at home, first or second string, should be quite quite easy to beat uh, Ospreys. So Ospreys also caused a few upsets this season. It should be quite an interesting game to watch. Yeah, the Ospreys have been a, one of the feisty teams uh, in this season's URC. You wouldn't put it past them to run Leinster close. I mean, I still don't expect Leinster to lose at home, um, but the Ospreys have consistently um, punched above their weight. Well, maybe I shouldn't say punch above their weight. They've they've been by far the, the best uh, Welsh franchise this, this season. Um, and you've now almost come to expect a decent performance from them. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it will be interesting. But, uh, again, it probably a lot boils down to how uh, Blenster will set out their stall. I, I, you know, I don't expect the team that played last week uh, to play on mass again. Yeah. I think I think with that game, my only comment would be that there's two ways of playing the Ospreys. You can either be like the Bulls and hit them hard and hit them early. Or you can let them drag you down into an arm wrestle, and that's where they've got a chance. I'm not sure if Lens allow them to do that, then the Ospreys have a chance. But Lens to hit them early, I can't see them coming back. Not in Dublin. No. Yeah. So those are your C uh, predictions for the week. Uh, we're going to finish off with one more. Uh, just to, the under twenty rugby championship is going on in in Australia. Um, we've seen some interesting results. Uh, South Africa drawing with New Zealand in their opening game. Australia losing quite heavily to Argentina. And then the All Black juniors bouncing back and beating Argentina in their second game. And uh, the junior box having an utterly woeful um, uh, game in, in, in the wrongly, um, how can I put this, the really bad the Sunshine, game, Coast. Sunshine Coast, where there was <laughs> torrential rain the whole time. And, and really playing terrible against Australia. And, and even though that, I mean, my whole takeaway from the game is this Australian team, despite the commentators trying to make it out as if they were superhuman, are quite ordinary. Mm. And the junior box losing to them was a huge disappointment. I was just thinking of something. Imagine buying tickets to a KC on the Sunshine Band concert and you end up getting wet, wet, wet. Um, but that's besides the point. Look... If, if you look at the result against New Zealand, uh, I think most people would have expected South Africa to be very much on the front foot against Australia. Also, when you consider the way Australia uh, were defeated against Argentina, the woes they had in the scrum, um, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. They dominated South Africa at set piece. Um, the scrums, I, I, can, I can barely remember the last time a South African team was dominated to that extent by an Australian team. Uh, and then in the second half, the junior box also lost their way in the lineouts. And I know that conditions were tough, but the Aussies um, played it better, certainly in that facet. So, you know, if you don't win set-piece ball, 
in those conditions, then it's going to be a tough afternoon, and that's that's how it proved. And I also just felt that the Aussies were more assertive. I mean, the, there was a a certain level of passiveness about the junior box that you wouldn't have expected them uh, wouldn't have expected that in a in, you know in in that particular encounter. So that that was a usually I'd say deflating uh, defeat. Yeah, I, th I think to me, just one the amount of handling errors, the amount of yeah, you know, just the way the box lost the ball, the junior box whenever they had the ball lost the ball, especially in that first half. Um, and obviously the red card didn't help. Um, it probably helped them in the yeah. end that there was a twenty minute red card and and, and players could come back. Yeah, but, yeah. But it, it wasn't it wasn't a great performance up front. I thought that could have been a lot more direct. Um, and it always just feels to me that backline that they picked. There's a lot of talent there and a dry field. I think they would have been exceptional. But they don't look like a wet weather backline, if I can put that. Yeah. Way. And tactically, they I think also very well. Yeah, I think the changes that they've made, I mean, they didn't certainly didn't play with the same authority at, uh, at fly-off. You had guys in midfield, you could bash it up straight, uh, but not always looking for opportunity a little bit wider, you know, when there is a potential overlap. Um, so, you know, a, a bit more game awareness in that game as well would have, would have uh, stood them in good stead. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot that they can take out of it. But now the problem is, uh, what do they have to play for in the last one? Um, because yeah, after well, a draw and a defeat, it's, you know, uh, uh, competition. Just judging well. on what we've seen, I mean, I, I expect the, the All Black juniors to probably smash Australia in that last game mm. um, and, and win quite handsomely. And that'll probably mean that they take, they take the title then. Um, so, yeah, I suppose pride, they've got to get, get the, the performance back. But let's have a listen to Coach Bufan and the who talk after the game uh, about exactly where it went wrong for them and what they can do. Yeah, it's a bit dark at the moment, but um, I think you've summed it well. You know, just lots of opportunities, just really, you know, probably our skill set in looking after the ball just wasn't up to it. Um, perhaps our decision making around our set piece wasn't up to it when we've got into the right areas as well. Um, we got ourselves into the right places, which is what, you know, was a big thing from the previous game. And then I, from then on, it was about execution and actually just getting to, you know, getting into a system. And you could see once we built a bit of momentum, we really could put, could really build some pressure. Yeah. Red card probably hurt us a bit because, as you know, when you've got 14 guys in the field, everyone else has to fight that much harder um, and takes a lot of energy away from you. But um, I don't think anyone goes out into the field to intentionally hurt other people. Uh, so, you know probably a bit of a brain fog moment there, but, you know, he learned, he learned. Yeah, I mean, like as I said to the boys after the game, you know, I said, if, if your set piece doesn't function at test rugby, you pretty much got no chance, really. And today, I think we had two in there, 22 line-outs, we didn't convert, we didn't get the ball back, so we have to scramble there. I just, we have to go back and look at the video and really understand what was going on in the scrums. But, yeah, clearly we didn't get ascendancy, which is something that we'd really hope to do today. Um, and yeah, that's what's working against you because it just takes away so much energy and it just, you know, you have to find other ways to fight and stay in the game. Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit of both. Obviously, you know, it's probably nicer to learn while you're winning. Um, it's not nice to be sitting on this side of it. Um, so I, we understand what this is about. All the teams made changes today, massive changes. We understand that it's about the learning process and the development of players. Uh, you know, that never really goes away from us. And we're also probably getting some answers around, you know, the players, where they're at, what they need to work on going forward. The only way they can get that is through these type of matches and these types of pressures. Uh, you know, again, it would have just been nicer to be on the learning side while you're winning. I guess we, you know, we've got our backs against the wall now from that perspective. Uh, you know, so we just have to make sure that we find ways to get better for Argentina and show that we are learning and we are actually moving in the right direction. Well, on that note, uh, it's, a, it's a big week of rugby ahead again for us. Lots of URC action. And, um, yeah, it's quite enjoying the autumn weather. Liam, I hope you'll be um, opening a few bottles. I was in Dahlstrom last weekend on the, on the off weekend for my teams. 
I had uh, uh, quite a few. <laughs> I'd like to uh, you know, you. take the trash away from where we were staying. Um, uh, we'll notice the little <laughs> bottles that they can recycle. So um, hopefully well, you're going to have the yeah. same sort of weekend. Uh, yeah, hopefully. I mean, I see that in my future, uh, not the distant future. Um, but I also was thinking uh, before the show, uh, you know, about uh, getting to a couple of wine farms uh, at some point. Um, and it needs to happen sooner rather than later. Um, because it's one thing going into a bottle store, opening a bottle of wine, and I'm having a good time. That's that's one thing. But uh, going to source uh, is quite another. I think we'll definitely have to do that. Um, uh, but we must maybe talk offline about some plans there. Yeah, I, I, I know somebody who can probably help set us up. Maybe a guest, you know, in a few weeks can help uh, make that happen. We'll Sound, that sounds very that. good for me. So, okay. That's it for this week. We'll chat to you again next week. See you then. Thanks for listening. And a reminder, you can find all the To The Last Drop podcasts on the Brendan Nell YouTube channel, iono.fm, Spotify, player.fm, Pocket Casts, Google Podcasts, and iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts.